Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef and I'm thrilled you're here. And I am so excited about today's interview. Uh, this, is, uh, this is someone that's been on the show before. And the last time she was on, her, on the show, I was so enamored by her that I said, you know, I want to be friends with this lady. And she has now become a very good friend. In fact, she's coming to stay in our guest house again. She's been here many times, her and her <laughs> daughter, and she's bringing her husband this time. It's Maureen Miles. Now, she is a rock star in this business. She's in Atlanta, and she's, you know, I don't know how many thousand units she has now, but she's done it all, and I'm just thrilled to have my friend back on the show. Maureen, welcome. Well, thanks, Rod. How you doing? How I you doing? Fantastic. Nice to be here. I appreciate it. And, and I'm really glad to have you back on the show. I know that it's going to be an incredible episode, and, you know, Maureen is part of my mastermind. She's been at my, she was at my Tampa event, uh, and added a ton of value. She was one of the panelists and added a ton of value and just very, very blessed to have you back on the show. I know you're very busy. Um, so, um, you know, tell, tell my listeners again, just a quick um, kind of backstory on how you got in this business. I got to share one thing. Okay. Now, now, you know, one thing that, 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 that is really, really cool. Both Maureen and I in a previous life loaded trucks for UPS. And now Maureen's got, I don't know how many tens of hundred million dollars worth of real estate and <laughs> both loaded trucks. So, you know, if you think that, you know, you have to start with a silver spoon in your mouth or you have to start, you know, with, with a PhD or, you know, whatever, I'm here to tell you, you don't. So anyway, so tell your backstory because it's That's awesome. right. And just a note on the loading truck things, Rod, I think if you, I did that for six years. So wow. uh, I lasted two life. weeks. I lasted two weeks. I, lo I think I lost about 20 pounds in those two weeks. So yep. that says a lot about you. And, yeah. and in fact, I make fun of it at my live event. I show that Lucy video where the chocolates and stuff, how they're trying to, trying to manage <laughs> all the stuff coming off the conveyor belt. And that was me trying to build these walls and these trucks. But, you know, that was the hardest work I've ever done. I can't believe you lasted six weeks. I mean, six, six years. Holy. Yeah, that, that's where I met my husband too. He comes from that as well. Wow. And uh, I'll tell you, if you can make it through that, you could do anything. Because I yeah. said, the, and no offense to UPS, they got a good grade, paid for some of my schooling. It was good. But uh, if you can make it through that job, you could do anything. I said, what I'm gaining, I always try to, even when the experiences are so good, I always try to say, what am I getting out of this? you know, where's the silver lining? And I say, you know what? I'll never have a job this bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, UPS. Yeah, but, uh, no. Hey, listen, listen, <laughs> sitting in the back of a hot truck, trying to keep up with the boxes coming off a belt. Sweat oh, going in your yeah. eyes every time you bend over, like it's oh, hardcore. No, There's, no, you know, no, that's, no. That's, hell no, no. You yeah, should have stars for that or a tattoo right. or something. <laughs> so, so let's talk about how you got into this business. Um, and you know, brag a little bit about where you are now, because otherwise I'm going to brag for you. Oh. So talk about how you got started and then, um, you know, where you're at now. Well, I was, I was a network engineer for a large telecom company um, that on my last podcast, we went over that story. Mm -hmm. uh, we started, my husband didn't have the greatest uh, retirement plan. He worked for our town. So we decided that we wanted to start buying some multifamily. We had done some flips in the past. Uh, I kind of grew up around remodeling. I understand I could build a house myself, went to school for electrical. Uh, when, when he didn't really have much of retirement, um, I had a good retirement plan with the telecom company, but there are always like layoffs possible. Sure. So I wanted to just have something else to start building cash flow, have a more secure future for my family, not have to move if they said you had to move. Uh, so we started buying some smaller multis, uh, mm -hmm. and that just kind of grew. I worked full time. He worked full time. Uh, we built up to about 30 units or so. Uh, I learned how to bring, um, some investors in then. So that was my first thing in dealing with investors just on a small scale, but mm -hmm. we really maxed out our time. I said, you know, I won't, I don't have the hours in a day to be able to kind of build my cash flow enough to really be able to ever quit my job and I was making six figures. I made good income. And, you know, so I just said, okay, how do I get it bigger? I saw people buying bigger apartment complexes. I just didn't know how it was done. I mean, at the time I didn't really know it was possible for single people to kind of own and manage these giant apartment complexes. Uh, right. even is, yeah, if a tenant comes up to me and said, Oh, you're the owner. I'm like, Oh no, no. I said, I'm not the owner. I'm like, people don't own these companies own these. And they're always like, Oh yeah. Okay. You never want to be the owner on your property. Um, so I always am the asset manager, 
But just just knowing that and, and making that uh, transition, knowing that it was possible and starting, I started to just reach out to other networking groups and started to get more involved with real estate and finding other people that did what I wanted to do. I yep. see. Okay. So, you know, I know that you've done over a hundred million dollars with the real estate. And so um, let's talk about Let's talk about let's talk about syndication today and talk about how you I, I know you've got a how many investors do you have now? I mean, how many investors do you work with regularly? Um, we got it, it. It must be pretty close to probably 200. I'd say somewhere between like 160 and 200. We have several wow. investors in in uh, many deals that they're repeat investors. And sure, sure. I mean, once you make an investor some money, they, you've got them for life. I mean, you, that, that's yep. really how it works. And so let's, let's drill down on, on finding investors for deals. That'll add a lot of value to my listeners. So, you know, when you first got started, you know, to talk about how you did that and then, you know, maybe how that evolved and, and maybe some of the, some of the, some of the ways that you approach people, where you find them, you know, just let's dig into that, that part of the business a little bit. Yeah. In the beginning, um, it was mostly from my own uh, personal network. Actually, my very first uh, investor was a cousin of mine. He worked a lot of hours. Uh, He liked what we were doing. Uh, He saw us renovating houses and small multis and he thought it was awesome and he wished he had more time to be part of it and he didn't really have any extra time he worked like 80 hours a week so um so then that's when we actually he was like my first i hadn't even really thought of investors at the time and he was the first one like oh you know let me pull you in we'll start splitting some of these smaller multis we'll work out a deal with cash flow and that was kind of how I started doing it. So fr- friends and family, which is how a lot of people yeah. start, you know, and I, I mean, I tell the story when I was in my 20s, I bought tens of millions of dollars worth of property 50-50 with partners, but they were That's actually partnerships. The they too. weren't syndications because, you know, yeah. to be a partnership, the uh, the partner has to have some level of involvement. And, you know, in my mm-hmm. case, like I'd have to get approval if I spent over a thousand dollars or something. And then it was a true partnership. But yeah. But but then, right you know, you got right into syndications, I'm sure, after that, right? Yep. So uh, I worked with him and some other just smaller investors here and there. And then, yeah, when I did the syndications, I remember my first raise was $1.1 million. Uh, a partner was supposed to bring part of it. Um, I was supposed to bring uh, another part of it. And so that was through the networking groups at that time. So I was, as I was trying to find out more uh more about the multifamily and the larger groups. As I was learning how to do syndications, I, um, I just, I, I met different people that wanted to do the same thing. So uh, a lot of them you can use IRA money for, which is great because they can't put that in their own deal, your IRA money in most cases. In some cases you can, depending on the size of the deal, but typically you can't use your own IRA money for the smaller deals. So they were looking for somebody to invest with. And right. just as we got to know each other, going to different events and kind of you see people over and over again. Uh, and then you just kind of start clicking with certain people that are, you know, you see repeatedly at these conferences. Well, it's, re- it's relationship building. I mean, really, it's, ma- it's, it's building friendships, right? I mean, would you, could, you, could you dumb it down to that? I mean, really, that's, that's what it is, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. This business is a lot of, it's, it's a lot of fun. And you got to, right. I think for people to do it to a certain level, you, it's, it's not about just, the money or the retirement. It's like, you have to have a passion for it, you know, right. or, you know, yeah, you just, you, you have to love what you do, but as you start looking into it more and doing more networking, you start meeting other people that just love this stuff. I mean, I call them, I call them deal junkies sometimes because it's so right. much fun. Like you think about real estate all the time. You you'll turn around your car, even if you're late to go somewhere you're like, oh, wait, I got to go look at that building. I just passed. That was an awesome building. So uh, right. I mean, that, that's truly how you should be in this business, guys. If you, if you want to be a success in this business, you've got to either love it or learn to love it. If you, you've heard me say that dozens of times. If you don't, then go do something else because right. life's too freaking short to load you're trucks, right? right? So, really, you're right to load trucks all the time, yeah. but you'll be in good shape. Uh, right, uh, right, like, right. <laughs> but uh, you, you just really meet. What I love about this business is I think to get to a certain level in this, you you really have to do the right thing um, and have the right mindset. And, you know, it's not about the quick buck. It's about long-term relationships, uh, you know, building relationships with investors and with owners of properties and stuff like that. Right. So when you're in it, you get to really meet some other passionate people and just real, just like yourself. I, I like um, anything I could ever do to help you out and your listeners, just because 
I know you're really trying to help people. And so you just meet some really genuine, awesome people. Yeah, Waiting no question. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And, 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 and you're right. Uh, and, you know, any time, I mean, I know you're very giving of your time uh, and, and, and help, helping educate and push people forward and help them. I mean, any time you add value like that, it comes back to you you know, tenfold. I mean, it's just the law of the universe. And, 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 uh, you know, you, that's why I connected with you. Cause I, you know, I could see you're giving heart and I, I, I'm a giver and, and that's just how I roll too. And, and so, you know, that's why we connected and, and, and that's why we're each so successful. Uh, and, yep. and, you know, and, and, and so, so guys come at it from that. Don't come at it from a take standpoint, come at it from what can you give? Because whatever you give, you get back. And, 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 you know, you know, Maureen's an absolute testament to that. Um, so and, and a, one of the reasons too that I like to give is as I was progressing through this, my kids were younger, they were teenagers. Uh, and you know, I, I like this business for them and they, they grew up around renovations and real estate. Uh, so they're good. And so just, <laughs> oh, oh there's my there's caitlin oh, you guys on itunes can't see her but that's her beautiful yeah, oh, daughter who works her. in the business oh, and she, she's about 100, 110 pounds soaking wet but she scares the hell out of the contractors on the projects that she yeah. that she works on repositioning projects in atlanta yeah. for maureen every day and, the, the projects yeah. you've got the cops on speed dial sometimes i know you've got yeah. great relationships with the uh with the police there. Caitlin, welcome. I'm glad you're oh, here. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. I just wanted to say hi. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So Caitlin, Caitlin's come down here with her mom and stayed with us. So she's she's yeah. part of the family here too. So place. Yeah, 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 it's awesome. cool. But but just knowing that you're making a better life for you know generations ahead of you when you get into this too. You're not just teaching them to go to work every day nine to five, uh, you right. know, basically be a slave until you can retire hopefully and maybe have enough money to support yourself in retirement. Like it's just, it's no, a massive I mean, business. You know, and you're, you're doing that for your investors too. I mean, you're, you're helping them. You know, there are a lot of them that can't, can't or don't want to be active in this business. And, and there's some that utilize uh, the limited partnership platform to move forward into doing their own syndications and things like that. In fact, we're doing a deal right now uh, where the, uh, uh, the, one of the co-sponsors, that's raising money for the deal actually was a limited partner in up to 1700 units. And now he's actually co-sponsoring this deal. So it's, you know, being a limited a partner in a deal, a passive investor uh, is sometimes a springboard to uh, actually being a co-sponsor and then ultimately, or, or, or a KP on a deal and then ultimately being a, a sponsor on a deal. So, uh, but let's talk about, um, you know, when you're talking to a potential passive investor in a deal, you know, what sorts of questions do you ask or what sorts of alignments do you look for when you start that dialogue? I mean, I, mean, I know you've been at it a long time. Hopefully you can remember when you first started what, what you look for. <laughs> well, a lot of times it was just that uh, people that I felt uh, were passionate about what they were doing to you. They just, they wanted a nice safe place for their money. Uh, and just to back up a little bit on what you just said, Rod, a lot of people get into this thinking this is great. You know, there's a few people out there that sell it that they can do it two hours a week i think to do a successful i mean i work a lot but i love what i do i'd rather work 80 hours in this not that i work any 80 hours every week uh, it's probably more like a hundred some weeks <laughs> okay, just kidding. but i'd rather do this than work 40 hours at a job anytime i absolutely love it so right. um, these uh a lot of people they go and they learn about syndication and learn about doing these large properties and being able to acquire them but you know what, they just sent, spent 40 years in the post office and they're looking to put their money to good use, but they don't want another full-time job. Uh, a lot of people and, and you know, flipping is great for a lot of people and uh, hard money lending is awesome for a lot of people if you're in that business. But if, you know, if they're new to it, they're fresh retirees, they just, they want to kind of kick back. They have this money now that they don't want to erode the basis on. They want to be able to have that chunk of money that supports them through their retirement and they just want to make money on it never touch that seed money right this is a great avenue but again they a lot of them don't want another full-time job they just worked for a long time so that's really where i find that what i do offers a great value to people like that and so for for your um syndications and and anyone that does it 
you know, they put their money in, they get their check. We do ACH payments. So uh, I had one guy, he likes to travel to the Mediterranean. He's like, Maureen, I never even have to cash my check. You put it right in the bank. Yeah. And he loves it. Uh, yeah. But I met them through a, a, a class learning how to do syndication. And they said, you know what, once I went through it, I realized I don't really want to be that the syndicate. Sure. Uh, sure. And everybody has their own, you know, some people want to retire and, and be aggressive and active. And that's totally uh, fine. But Do you, you know, work I'm, mostly with people that are close to retirement? No, uh, actually, I get a lot of my, a lot, I have a lot of doctors um, mm -hmm. a lot of, and doctor groups. Uh, they like to share and talk once you can get into a couple doctor groups and you give them a great return and, and they understand that you're genuine and you're on the ball, then it, it just opens up. It opens sure. up the whole network and all kinds of doctors. I always say, I'll be pretty healthy because I have a bunch of doctors all over that are specialists. I said, if right. I ever get sick, I think I have some good contacts to reach out to. They yeah, they're, to they're, they're high net worth. They're all accredited. They, you know, they, 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 um, they don't necessarily make the best operators because, you know, they're, well, they they're, don't have time. They they're, don't have time. Very, they really yeah, they're don't. very limited in their time, but they're smart and they understand right. that this is a great investment uh, and they understand how it's different than stocks and how it's a great diversification tool. So, so when you when you meet someone for the first time, how do you make sure you're aligned in their in their investment goals versus what you're doing in your in your deals? I'm just curious how you do it. I know how we do it. I'm just curious what you do. Well, what I do is I, I tell people what I do if they're interested, right? If somebody's looking for something, usually by now it's mostly introductions now, right. but, or I meet through a networking group and they understand what I do and they ask me questions and I throw it out there. I'm never like trying to like more people in or anything like that. Like I, I never want to get somebody in my deal and then have them lose sleep overnight, you know, wondering if it's the right choice for them or something. Right. I just think it and they either like it or they don't and for some people it's not for them and that's totally right. okay but it's not I don't really try to sell it they just right. if it's right for no, them it's all questions right it's all asking yep. questions right and and that's how you do it okay and you want right. to make sure it's a good fit that's all you don't ever want to take somebody's last uh, you know if they have a hundred and two thousand dollars in their savings account and they want you to take a hundred like I wouldn't take it like you exactly I said, we don't control the market. We work within the market, right? So there are definitely a lot of things we can control. And the more experienced you are, I think the more you can make sure that everybody's funds are safe in that market, the more you're familiar with the market. But um, ultimately, you don't want to, you know, take, you, know, you, you want it to be a good investment for investors. Sure. You don't want somebody so hungry to do it that their last couple dollars are in the deal. It's, that's not a good we, You know, we get a lot of investors that are wanting to learn the business and, and grow into the business. And so we, we, place a, we, we spend a lot of time in the educational process. And like, you know, like we just had a webinar yesterday on a, on a, on a deal that we're, uh, we're almost, we've got a, a two or three spots left in it, but it, it's uh uh, you know, part of the process and part of the allure for us is, is that educational component is learn, learn the business, look over our shoulders. So we, we spend a lot of time in that. Do you find that much with yours or are yours mostly hands off? No, no. So um, I actually do when I, especially when I meet people during the networking groups, and that's a, that's a great way to get in a deal. I mean, how are you going to, there's a lot of kind of hurdles you have to make and fear right. that you run into as you're trying to do your first deal. But sure. being part of somebody else's deal is a great way to learn because you learn not only what is the paperwork for, what is a PPM, what are the sub docs, how do they sell it, what is a accredited investor versus a not accredited investor, who can I take? So by working with a group that's done it before, um, and I've had many people that own quite a few units now kind of start through coming into one of my deals. Right, they right. They explain the paperwork. Um, and they get to firsthand, it's, they get to firsthand see what is a, what do you have to provide to your investors, right? So that's a key thing. Well, even beyond that, they're seeing, they're seeing, they're seeing the deal acquisition process. They're seeing the due deal, you know, maybe, maybe some are even, you know, uh, in tune with what you did due diligence wise and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, that you, you, you let them know the type of financing you put on it. And, and, and then, and then I'm sure you educate them on, on your business plan for the property. You know, what do you, what do you plan to do as far as renovations to reposition it and get the rents up? So they're kind of seeing the whole thing, right? Yeah. And just, just from that, end, like, you don't want to go into it blind on your first deal either. It's great. And I didn't have two nickels to rub together when I started, so I couldn't uh, be a part of it, but I would have done anything to be able to put my money in a deal and do that. Right. Right. 
they re you really do get a firsthand approach. And so um, I did have a, a, a lot of friends and stuff as I went through all the networking groups to learn how to do this. Uh, I did meet a lot of people that wanted to do it. So I was finally able to put some deals together and, you know, get, get things rolling. But I still had a lot of friends that were trying to do their first one. So one of the things I like to do is I like to take, um, like our units are typically $100,000. Uh, so, so your minimum investment, like ours, typically is 100000 as well. Like this deal that we're, we're, uh, we've got a few spots left, they're $100,000 units, it's called. I just want to explain what a unit is to my listeners, right? Oh, okay. sure, sure. But you can, now we have in our documents um, that we, it's up to our discretion. So, and the reason we put that in there is because for a lot of these people trying to get their first deal, what I, I wanted to do was to break apart my, I'd always take a couple units and break them apart into a $50,000 chunk because for a lot of people, 100,000, that may be their earnest money in a deal. That may be something reserved for their deal and they wanna be part of it, but they don't wanna put that large a chunk in. So sometimes I even did a 33,000 one time. So you could break them into three parts and that gives the people trying to do it you know, without taking all their um, reserve money or something that they want. For all their, their, yeah, all their liquidity, right. Yeah, they can be part of a deal and you can break it into chunks and it's a little That's bit- That's a really good deal. idea. That's a really good idea. You know what? I, yeah. I think I'm going to do the same thing. And it's, so, it's you know- I'm gonna It gives your same. listeners a chance to be part of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Fun. That's a great idea. So guys, if any of you listening are accredited and you want to get in on a deal, I'll break apart these last few units because- uh, you know, I'd love to have more people in it and educate more people. So if, if you're interested, uh, just text uh, the word partner to 41411 and, and we'll set up a call with me or Robert and we can, we'll break it up. Maybe we'll do the 30, we'll do thirds or something ourselves yeah. um, as well on this Dayton deal. But if, if you're accredited and want to know a little bit more about how, you know, you can look over our shoulder and, uh, uh, and, and learn this business and uh, uh, while you're investing in one of our deals, and this particular one I'm, that we're talking about here is a fantastic deal, but, but you know, learn this business uh, while you're investing, then, then just text partner to 41411 and we'll talk to you all about it. So uh, I know, uh, let's talk for a minute about um, how, you know, how do you keep um, the relationships with your investors you know, warm and, and allow them to feel like they're connected and you're transparent. And how do you report to them? What do you do to, to keep them in tune with what's happening on your projects? Give it, tell my listeners, you know, so well, they we can- do have, We do have monthly reports. So every, the close of every month, we have a report go out by like the 20th of the following month. And that'll have, uh, we have everything. We have bank statements, T12, balance sheets. We list anything. Every once in a while, we'll have an investor that comes in and says, hey, can you show me this? And we're like, sure. So now we have everything pretty fine tuned to anything that anybody would want to see, but total Great. transparency. And that's important to, to just know that you can log in and uh, see your last monthly, the, the bank account, where is the money going? And, and that does give them uh, assurance. I think right. in the beginning, people pay more attention to the reports than after a deal is done because sometimes we'll change something and everybody will have to log in again. And we'll get people like a year and a half later. They're like, I never, like, I'm like, we show you never logged in. So right. people gain confidence. Uh, they, we notice they don't care so much, but, but there's some investors, especially like in my IT background, I have a lot of people I had worked with in that field. They're more the engineering type that they do check every single month. And I, I like that because it keeps me uh, on the ball as well. Sure. But, uh, you know, sure. But, but do, you, do you do any other communication? Or are you just talking to them on the phone regularly? Do you, you know, I know some investors, they'll do like a monthly webinar or a PowerPoint or something. Do you do yeah. any of that? Or do you, do you find you don't need to? We don't do that. Our, just our, I mean, our, like I said, we have a lot of busy doctors in IT and, and they're, we don't, we, we're accessible whenever they need anything. Whenever yeah. they have any questions on anything, they can always get a hold of us. Uh, okay. And we respond. So, and I think that's one of the differences between what we do and, and stocks too, just to throw right. that out there. You know, if your GE stock is dropping, you can't just call and say, Hey, what's going on? Or, right. you know, how is this going? You know, we're, and not that mine ever drops, but it's just, you know, it's nice to be able to pick up the phone of the person in charge of your funds and say, Hey, what's going on with this? Is this looking good? Do we think we'll sell? Are we going to stay in longer? And we do bounce ideas like that off of people before we make a decision to sell. 
uh, you know, or transition a property or, you know, refi, whatever we're going to do, we, we bounce it off the investors. Love it. So let me ask you this, knowing what you know now, if you could go back and tell your 21 year old self, actually she's sitting right next to you, if, but she's a little <laughs> older than that now. But if you could, if you could tell yourself, if you could tell yourself what you're telling Caitlin, what would you, what might you do differently now that, you know, that you know what you know? Um, just, I mean, just for actually life in general, it's, I think it's fear in your own head that you have to be able to control that fear. What I've learned is that the more I look at straight in the, like, if something challenges me, it actually gets me excited. I, I love it. I like to be challenged. That's I like great. it. It just like feeds me. Um, you, you turn the fear into a challenge and you re, you basically repurpose the, the emotion in your head. Love it. Yeah, it, it feeds me. So like this, this deal I'm doing now, uh, we're doing a deal in Columbus, uh, Georgia. And like, it's the first one I'm doing with no partner. So I, I wow. it's totally under my control, which is cool. Um, not, I did have control of the other ones too, but this one is fully on my shoulders and I, I love it. Um, it's, Time-wise, uh, I'm I'm pull, I'm doing everything myself, but I actually I love the challenge, and it actually kind of uh, I don't know, it just like kind of refueled this whole energy about it. I'm excited, but but that's the biggest thing. It's us holding us back uh, in our own heads. Right, right. Our Limiting head, beliefs, like, fears, you know, uh, previous yeah. setbacks that 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 stop us from taking action. And what I've learned too, and I I listened to something. I wish I could remember what it was exactly, but they the way they described it was perfect. They say when something scares you or you're fearful of something, you look it on and you take it on and it diminishes that fear mm -hmm. for next time. If you, if you shrug back and it wins, it's going to be bigger next time. Mm -hmm. So it kind of accumulates. So I think anytime you're fearful of doing something, you, you have to just grit your teeth and go for it or it's going to win next time. So you have to, you know, really, really understand in your head when you're psyching yourself out of something. And that's been my biggest thing is just being able to not be so fearful because, you know, if I'm scared to move forward, I think for a second, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? What do I have control over? How do I diminish that from happening or diminish that risk from happening? Can I get comfortable with it or maybe even eliminate the risk that I know? And so when you have a great group of, a great network of friends and things like that, that mm -hmm. you've met through this too, if I have, you know, oh my, there might be a fire, you know, I have insurance. I have people I can reach out to that have been through it before if I sure. have any questions. So, okay, that doesn't have to scare me. Um, you know, what else can happen? Um, you know, maybe the rents, I can't grow aggressively as I thought. Well, you know what? I can reach out of the box. I can rent washer and dryers. I can rent. I tell everybody if I had to stand out in the parking lot in a hot dog suit and rent parking spaces to my tenants, <laughs> I do it. Like we don't fall short on our numbers, but, right. uh, you know, it's just doing whatever it takes and knowing that uh, that you got yeah. it. And I think that that also helps you grow confident. Like I'm a hundred times more confident now than I was when I started because you're not really sure if you're going to be good at it when you first started. Sure. Um, and I, I learned getting in this, I can run circles around a lot of these operators now. Sure you uh, can. Because no I started with small stuff and, and learn the rope. So that was huge with me. When you're self-managing, like all your listeners that think, Oh, am I wasting time? I should be doing bigger things. But that's going to give you the confidence when you get into the bigger stuff that you'll that's know. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that's a great progression is to start with, with, with plexes and smaller multifamily and, and, and push forward and just in continually, continually challenge your risk muscle, your courage muscle. And that's how it grows. Um, yep. So what do you think is, is, you're a leader, you've got a whole organization, you've got a lot of people working with you. What do you think is one of the greatest characteristics that a leader should have? Um, I think one is integrity for sure. Um, great character. Uh, right. You know, even when people aren't watching, you have to do, try to present what you want your team to be and to kind of be that, be that person you want them to be. Um, and just knowing that you're in there with them. It should be a, with my own personal people, actually I go, I really butt heads on this a lot with people, but to me, it's, it's a we thing. I, I would do anything with them if, I mean, I tell everybody, like we're doing a large rehab now that we're kind of get to the end of the cycle on. Right. It's been a, but I said, you know, if I got to go down and paint units to get this sucker done, it's going to get done. And just knowing that it's not like a, a them and you or, 
um, that you're above them. I mean, we're all the same. We're all a team trying to get this done. And I think that's one of the reasons I have some really great people uh, that work with me. Because they know um, you'll roll up your sleeves and do whatever it takes. Absolutely. You're not absolutely. trying to, you know, you're not trying to find blame and push and, 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 and yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. Um, <laughs> tell me about a time that, um, that you made a mistake, uh, a big one, and the lessons that you got from it. Let me see. Um, probably, uh, yeah, it's sometimes being a little too trusting. I think, I think in this world, just in general, as default, we think a lot of people are um, like us. And I, I think no matter who you are, you think other people are like you. Um, right. And sometimes, um, well, being in this business and just being, I think, a landlord in general when I first started, you get to read people pretty well. Mm -hmm. Uh, typically I can sit down with somebody in five seconds. I, you're going to know, know what they're about. Them, yeah. You can tell if the little hair, like if you, you know, you get like, yeah, you trust that you, when the hair on the back of your neck stands up, trust yeah. that because your body, yeah. you, you, you know, subconsciously, you know, there's a book called blink and it's about, you know, how, how someone can look at some, you know, they, they equate it to like art experts that can look at a piece of art that nobody knows is a fake it is a fake but an art expert they intuitively know it is they don't know why they know but they know it's fake and it's it's the same thing with people you know you've yeah. got to trust that intuition uh and and so you you know like like me i'm, I'm sure you've had some some uh relationships that just didn't work out quite the way you wanted um and, and yeah, sometimes I don't cut it off as soon as I, 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 I like to try to give people another chance. I probably empathize a little too much with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they go, oh, they're having a hard time. This is happening in their life. That's happening in their life. And you try to give them a chance and, and uh, help them out. Uh, a couple of rules of thumb, though, I have learned from that is, you know, one of the things I like to say, especially when I'm looking at my team members and stuff, is you can't teach work ethic. Um, you can teach skills. So I would much rather take somebody that uh, doesn't know how to do something, but ha like they want to learn and they're but aggressive they and they're honest. Yeah. And I love working with people like that, as opposed to somebody that they could be an expert, but nobody wants to work with this guy because, you know, he, he lies and he's full of crap. You know, or or like, they don't have a good work ethic. They may have the technical knowledge, yeah. but, but, they're, but they're not either passionate about it or they don't work hard. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I'll take work ethic, any work ethic and passion over yep. uh you know over uh somebody that's got the skill sets any day right uh, right so so um last question why do you think some people fail at this business you know what what do you think you know what do you think um you know like right now there are there are there are operators out there that are buying deals they shouldn't be buying and and you know in this hot market they're not paying attention to the fundamentals but but in your experience, what, what, you know, what have you seen that, you know, people, mistakes people have made? Let's just talk from a mistake pin. We don't have to call it failure, but what are some big mistakes you've seen? Um, some of the things I see are just people being too careless. Like you, when you take an investor on, you have to know this, this person or couple or whatever, they, they work 20 years to build up that nest egg sometimes. And, you know, you really have to take ownership of that and realize yeah. that it's you that stands between them. They're not, they're not underwriting the deal. They're not going to be there every day. So you want to make sure that it's, you know, that you're doing everything you possibly can to protect that money yep. and take ownership of that. And I think some people don't feel that same weight like I do and a lot of the other. Yeah, you know, me too. No, you, you, it's their livelihood. It's everything they've worked Absolutely. for. Yeah. Their kids' college fund sometimes. That's I mean, right. I have futures of children generations on right. my shoulders that my property is performing. Uh, so that's a big weight. But um, sometimes too is what I see in a lot of teams and partnerships too, is them thinking that um, that's not my job. Like mm. I'm going to get this deal together, but it's not my job to operate on it. And so if anything starts getting flaky, everybody just kind of like says, Oh, well it should be you. It should be you. And they start this bickering match, which is terrible. And you'll right. see partners, you know, partnership fail, fail like that because, Right. Um, they're not taking ownership where I always want to work with people that say, oh my, like this is, uh, maybe these units aren't getting turned enough. And not that we'd ever really have to go in and paint, but I want people that'd be willing to be down there painting those units. Hey, I, I've been, listen, when I had, you know, 800 units or 1,000 units, I was on a, I was on roofs sometimes pounding nails because it had to get done. And that's how you do it. And, and that's, you, know, you want, you want partners that, Right. Uh, and, and people and yourself too. Uh, the key person, they should be like, I, 
I'm going to make this work, whatever. I'm going to find a way. Uh, and I think, again, some people just tap out too easy. Um, you know, yeah. they, no, they no question. You know, any, any of you guys that are considering a partnership, um, yeah. you know, just, just realize it's a marriage and you have to, you have to treat it as such and really get to know the person. In fact, in my coaching program, we've got this 30 page document that we have people go through before they even consider a partnership because there's so many questions that need to get asked up front and, and you've got to trust your intuition and all those components come into play. Well, listen, Maureen, thank you so much. You've added so much value like usual and, and I'm going to get to see you this weekend. You're coming. Yes. Down. And I think Caitlin too. I think Caitlin's yeah, coming too. too. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. It's good to see you, sweetie. You go. we'll, <laughs> see you, we'll see you guys yeah. soon. Thanks for being on the show. And, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. you Thanks, guys. Right. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. For more resources or to connect with us further, please visit our website at rodcleaf.com. Tune in next week for our next show. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws.